It is terrific to see so many of you here tonight. Panelists didn't believe this is the way you dress your class every day, but I know that this is, this is the case that you're wearing suits and ties. You look great. Um, it really is a pleasure to be here tonight, uh, and I'd like to spend, extend a special thank you to the Play Center, the BSB, Brenda, Brenda Stover, and her team who do so much on the professional development side. Uh, the Villanova Financial Club, uh, which you'll hear a little bit about tonight, but uh, George Coleman was an uh, inspiration of the founding of that club and uh, will sort of be leading us off tonight. Bob Lasset has been involved very heavily too. I think he was, was he still the president or was he uh, just a member of the board member? That's, that's actually, there's no such thing as just a board member of the Financial Club. does so much for our students uh, on Wall Street and elsewhere, actually. Um, I'd also like to point out the Equity Society, as Alex, as Alex mentioned, the Fixed Income Society, Mergers and Acquisition Society, who are co-sponsoring uh, this event. So as Dean, one of the, the most important jobs and duties that I have is to make sure that uh, we are doing what we can to ensure job opportunities for those of you that are graduating from uh, not just the business school, but, but the university as a whole. And we've had a terrific success in the last 10 years Financial services, uh, finance continues to be one of our largest majors, but also there's opportunities for those that aren't finance majors. And really it is because of the efforts of alumni like the ones you see up here. Uh, the, the degree to which, as Dean, one of the things that is inspirational and humbling is the extent to which Villanovans look up Villanovans. And so, uh, George, I know, will point something out about how, uh, you know, prior to him coming to Villanova, uh, there was Villanovans who were helping Villanovans, and I just want you to make sure that you recognize the efforts that uh, alumni go through on your behalf to ensure that there are incredible job opportunities for, for those of you in graduate, and there certainly are. Uh, along those lines, um, not, not only has the Villanova Financial Club for over 10 years been involved in, in inspirational in this event and, and so many other uh, uh, issues, but we are in the process of launching a new finance department advisory Build on the success of the financial club, We're looking at recruiting opportunities, professional development, curricular, making sure that we're bringing back long, young alumni to help, help you all prepare for an interview process, for an understanding of the career, and make sure that we are second to none. We're second to none to places like Boston College, Georgetown, BC, schools that we aspire to compete with, and I think actually we do compete with, and we're given the opportunity to lead them handily. So I want to congratulate all of you being here, for showing such an active, uh, putting such an active face on for your own career, coming to professional development uh, events that the Clay Center has in addition to this, it is, it is the case that you as much to do with your success as we do. We take it very seriously. I, I, I'm grateful that we're taking advantage of what we have to offer. So without further ado, since I don't have much to add to the wisdom of this great panel, um, it's my pleasure to introduce George Coleman, who is uh, Vice Chair uh, of uh, Global Equities, I believe, right, that uh, Fred Suisse, he has been so active in so many things Villanova, he was a central uh, component and inspiration for the Villanova uh, uh, Advancement Office that we have in New York City that promotes and supports so many activities of the alumni up there and, uh, and, and so many other uh, initiatives that George has been involved with. So, uh, please welcome Mr. George Coleman, Class of 78.
high GPA, you're going to struggle to even get a first round interview in any of our firms. If you can drop down to the bottom right, you'll see initiative and drive. What are we looking for? We're looking for people who want to work. So, again, all of you, it's too late now, but if you were a caddy when you were 16, if you were a waitress when you were 16, if you worked at McDonald's when you were 16 or 18, you're going to interview really, really well because you have proven that you're a hustler. If you're here delivering pizzas, Communication skills. How many people here take public speaking classes? Don't be all of them. Yeah. Only one person raised their hand. I don't believe that. <laughs> well, and, and, all right, let's go the other one. Take one. And then after you take that one, take another one. Because you're going to need those skills when you're not only to get through the interview process, but when you come into the bank and you have to interact with your colleagues, it's, a, it's mission critical to be able to communicate. <coughs> Upper left. You're a team player. You know, can you collaborate? You know, we're looking for people that we want to sit next to. You know, we sit together. You know, I get to work every day before seven o'clock, and I don't leave there until after six o'clock every day. If I have to sit next to you, I want to make sure I'm sitting next to people that I can work with. And then, lastly, is leadership. You know, and again, there's a lot of opportunities here for those of you who are freshmen or, or, or sophomores. Think about service trips. Somebody's got to run these. It's important to be able to say in an interview. And Ask you a leadership question. What's your answer? Are you the head of your sorority? Are you the head of your fraternity? Are you the captain of the team that you're on? It could be an intramural team. But, you know, think about times in your life where you've had an opportunity to lead and get out of your comfort zone and do it. All right, so here's how, here's how it works there's first round interviews and then there's super day. First round interviews tend to happen here on campus, they might happen on a desk if they were in New York, uh, and, and they could happen in, in an HR department. And that's followed by, if you're lucky enough to pass the first round interview, you'll come to what we call Super Day. And Super Day is basically, you will be and go through five 30 minute interviews. That's two and a half hours. Now, you know, our panelists can talk about what it was like to do that. But let me tell you, if you're not prepared, you're going to really, really struggle. Um, one of the things I like to convey to people is that if we're going to have Super Day, and there's 30 candidates, so we're broken up into six different we're probably going to offer jobs the next day before applying for speaking. So think about that. You get all the way to Super Day, and you can go model model with other people who go to BC, and people go to Notre Dame, and go to Princeton, and go to Yale, which you can. You can, you can go model model with them, because that's what you're going to have to do. You, know, you will get offered a job the next day. So that's why I really have to emphasize the importance of it. Now, what we put here in this slide is these are the, the, the slides that we give the this is what the interviewer is being trained to think about. So the interview's job is to, like, basically, each of the five interviewees will drill down on each of the five core competencies. And they have to kind of figure out which competency, they might, they'll probably tell you which competency are they drilling down on, and you should have your answers already organized. Um, one of the things we tell candidates, uh, the interviewers, is to let the candidates speak 80% of the time. But well, we have a lot of chatty people, and as a result, you sometimes need to recognize that you have to force yourself into the discussion. You know, if you don't feel like you're talking 80% of the time, your interview is probably not going well. Interview structure. Uh, again, from our perspective, my job is to introduce myself to you, and the first thing I'm going to do is try to put you at ease. So I'm going to look for something on your resume that I connect with. So maybe it's that you're a lifeguard at the Jersey Shore, maybe it's you play golf, maybe it's Boy Scout, uh, maybe it's golf, I, I don't know what it is, but they're going to ask you a question about something on your resume, probably one of those things on the bottom. And, and the idea is to give you a softball question to kind of get you relaxed. Then they'll just go through the five core competencies which we've already talked about. And at the end of the interview, when they're winding down, they're going to ask you if you have any questions. You absolutely have to be prepared with two, three, four questions. I gave you some, I'm going to give you some suggestions. And then the other thing that's kind of not in here is my advice to you is this is your chance to say, Mr. Coleman, thank you very much for your time. And before we leave today, I want to reiterate how much I'm interested in the role of Credit Suisse. And then tell me, just reiterate two things about you that you feel really confident that make you special. In essence, ask for the order and reemphasize, you know, you want to hire me because. And whatever your two things are. 
back to the FICO conferences, whether it's leadership, whether it's intelligence, et cetera, and re emphasize two of the five, maybe three, that we think make us better. All right, this is, a, this is your own. And I'm not going to read this slide to you. You can kind of go through it for yourself. But these are, these are absolute musts. You know, you have to know the firm. So if, if, if in fact, you're interviewing a JP Morgan, and JP Morgan is in the newspaper because they're financing a Verizon Vodafone transaction, which is the largest transaction in the world, and you don't know about it, that's, that's not a good thing. What makes, you know, Barclays different than Credit Suisse and different than JP Morgan? Again, knowing the firm, knowing the differences, these are not difficult things to figure out. I mentioned what transactions have they been involved recently. And then know who the top leaders are, know that Brady Dewey is the CEO of Credit Suisse, know that um, uh, Jamie Dimon is the CEO of, of J.P. Morgan, etc. The second thing, know the position, know what job you're interviewing for. Make sure you've done some legwork and understand exactly what it is you're interviewing for. Uh, it should be easy between the seniors that are here that have had this internship already, the alumni that are willing to help you, the family, friends, etc. And then bottom one, know your resume. The worst thing if someone asks you a question about your resume and you don't come across as crisp. If I ask you a question and you start doing the um, the um, the um, I'm thinking you're lying. I'm thinking that you made something up. So don't put anything on there that's not real and know what you're talking about. And then the other thing I'd like to suggest to people do is make believe you're me. Try to make believe you're me and, and then, you know, in essence, what is George going to ask you? I'm not going to read all these questions to you, but these are, these are questions that we have given to the interviewers, and they're likely to ask you. The one I'll bring you to is the intellectual skills, where it says, how many ping pong balls fit in the 747? Now, have any of you ever heard of people asking, they call brain teasers, questions like that in the past? Yeah. Now, in this day and age, it's easy. Go on Google and get the answer. You know, but the answer, the truth is, we don't really
early interview. And again, these are these techniques that the panel will talk more about. But you know, this is where I said earlier I said like Super Day, it's a Super Bowl. Go for it. You know, you gotta go for it. This is important. You know, you have to be all in on you want this job. You know, speak slowly, don't swear, try not to not try not to do the ums. You know, speak confidently. There's a fine line between arrogance and confidence. You know, most of you probably can't about it. Um, market yourself, which is kind of go for it, if you will. Uh, body language, you know, sit up straight, lean forward, you know, don't be slouching, don't be crossing your knees, don't be you know, laying back like this, whatever. Uh, and then be prepared for technical questions and game teasers. I already told you that. Yeah, someone told me there's a book on them, the brain teasers, so if you really are worried about them, then you'll get the book. And I'm sure if you Google, like I said, 40 questions.
majority of what I'm going to do is just going to get these slides. We'll look at the slides and list of attributes that interviewers are looking for when they're interviewing for you. Knowing those catchphrases, finding a way to work those into your answers, making the, the oral reference to that word, right? The interviewer is looking for the word, give it to them. Okay? But then also give the story that exemplifies and demonstrates how you do that. Okay? That's just going to help them make a connection with what your resume said, what you said in the interview, and the words they're listening to. And then the follow-up email at the end of the Victoria Convention. If there's something that specifically resonated in your interview, if you made a connection, and you'll know when you make a connection, it remind the interviewer that you made that connection. Okay, thank you very much, Tom. I really enjoyed getting to talk about this, or getting to talk about what I did when I went on the service trip, or how I demonstrated leadership, and I know I'll make a terrific contribution to your company. Some of that so that when you're sitting around eating pizza and figuring out who's going to get the call back, right, when two people are tied, that's the right every time. Uh, can you talk a little bit about um, opportunities in operations and other air, other areas of what I would call shared services? Yeah, so I think what's one thing that's true about our business is it changes constantly. Um, never more so than right now. Uh, the dot factor changes just about everything we do. Um, what that has done um, across the board has made it harder to make money in most of our revenue businesses, but it's absolutely raised the burden for compliance, for control for segregation, for support, which means that roles like operations, compliance, um, legal, financial control, um, all have huge new opportunities right, to tackle new roles, to build new systems, to build new infrastructure, change the way the business operates. And we need to be smart people to do that. Right? These aren't the jobs that are getting shipped off to India. These aren't the jobs that are getting done in places like you know, Costa Rica and Mexico. Right? These are solving for problems we haven't even defined yet. And so these are the kinds of jobs that we should all be looking for because they're going to define how we do the next generation of our business. Right? Today, we trade things like credit derivatives, and 10 years from now, we might not. And I'll tell you, 15 years ago, we didn't. Okay? So new businesses will grow, and new things will happen because of changes to the rules. And we have to change the rules of people who are building the infrastructure or building the control process, but often the people who see where the business is going. And if it turns out your career ends up going in a revenue direction at some point, great. But you got you got into the ground floor learning how the business is going to change. Um, you know, the, the prospects for somebody going new and no less than a year with becoming a new commercial paper trader in today's market is, is, a, is a pretty challenging career path. Um, there are going to be new asset classes that grow. That's probably not one of them. Um, operations is a kind of place where you can move um, and reuse the skill sets and experience whatever the challenge is today. And today it's not fact. Tomorrow it'll be something in Europe. And two years from now, Asia's going to change the way we do stuff in Singapore and Hong Kong and Tokyo. Thank you. Steve, about well, um, could you just talk a little bit about uh, the opportunities that you see in today and it hasn't, hasn't changed a lot since 2001 when you got into it? Uh, yeah, the opportunities are kind of Baby boom generation that is retiring now, so a lot of these people need your services. Uh, in 2001, uh, 2000, 2001, 2002 was uh, you know, technology for a lot of people, uh, say, but they build themselves up in that uh, level. So uh, what happens then is people need the help of the wealth management process. 2008 came along, people did the same thing, they made some mistakes, they need the help of the wealth management process. So a lot of people are retiring, it's not just about it's not just about managing money now, it's about managing their income uh, for their time goals. Okay. And, and then Brian, you know, as an investment banker, I have a two-part question. One is, you know, talk about the analyst program and exactly what it is. And the second, second follow-up will be talk about what it's like to work for any bank that may not be as well known to our audience. Um, so maybe I will start with the second question because you know when you look at this panel, there are a number of very prestigious firms represented. The people capital market certainly isn't a brand name to most of you. But just to give you a sense as to who we are, BMO Capital Markets is the investment banking arm of the Bank of Montreal. Uh, BMO Financial Group uh, is the eighth largest financial institution in North America. We have 550 billion of assets with a market cap of 42 billion. We employ 46,500 people across five continents. So a very, very sizable organization. Within the investment bank itself, we call it capital markets. 
We have 275 investment bankers. We have equity capital markets, debt capital markets, and mergers and acquisitions. So we, every day, are trying to compete you know, with firms with such you know, brand names, such identity. You know, we really feel that we need to be much more proactive, and really sort of grind it out day in, day out, you know, to increase market share, to win um, transactions against very, very formal competition. You know, for an analyst joining our organization or any of these organizations, you should really expect to be challenged. Uh, in speaking to George last week uh, about the remarks or, uh, today, he asked, us, you know, he asked me to be candid with all of you. I hope to be very candid in terms of those remarks. And he also asked me to sort of talk to you as if you were you know, and nephews. One of the things I would say to you um, is you know, investment banking, an analyst within mergers and acquisitions, equity capital markets, and debt capital markets isn't for everybody. It really is a lifestyle choice, uh, in my opinion. Um, you know, there are a lot of career choices where you can work, you know, your tail off Monday through Friday, leave work at 6 o'clock, and not really have to think about anything until Monday morning. And this career choice, in this field, it really, you know, Mondays begin Sundays, and Fridays end on Saturdays. It really involves something, you know, much more, it's much different, and, you know, as I said, I really think it's a lifestyle choice. You know, as an analyst, um, in any of these firms, um, you know, you're, a lot will be expected of you. Um, you know, it's uh, no surprise that you know, you'll be doing a lot of what you'll be required to do is will be analytics, um, modeling, you know, when you're looking at companies or benchmarking them against their peers. Um, and all of this analysis that you do um, needs to be exact, it's very detailed, um, but it's used um, as part of a team to, you know, pitch new business, um, it's used to help, you know, for my own business, it helps us sort of understand the risk and what, you know, what a company's risk profile is so, so that we can decide whether we want to use the capital to support that business or we might be selling that capital to the marketplace. So it, um, you know, it involves a lot, of, uh, a lot of qualitative analysis, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, quantitative analysis, analysis as well. It can't just be all about the numbers. You need to be able to really sort of articulate, you know, what your financial work um, uh, concludes, you know, what it surmises. Um, everyone can have a uh, greater idea than as George spoke about earlier. You know, if you're not able to really sort of communicate those ideas to your clients, to your peers, to your bosses, you're never going to be successful. So there are great, great things about being an analyst on Wall Street. I think it's probably a profession that will challenge you unlike any other and really prepare you whether you stay in banking or not. Really prepare you for whatever it is you want to do. You want to be White House, you know, White House Chief of Staff or whether you want to run sort of dental practice somewhere on the West Coast. No matter what it is, this will really groom you for life. Um, but it really requires, I think, someone who absolutely is sort of dedicated to the thought of, uh, of this sort of website. And then follow up in terms of, so, and I appreciate your honesty in talking to the our nieces and nephews, uh, because if, if you want to be an analyst in the investment banking department, uh, it is a challenging job. It is, you know, you're, you're going to be working seven days a week, and you're going to get a test. That's the bad news. So let's flip to the good news. So, so tell me what you like about your job, the challenges that you enjoy. Um, you know, for my own career, when I look back on it, uh, you know, I've had a really, uh, just a tremendous career. You know, I've been exposed to things that, you know, when I sat in your seat many years ago, I never thought I would be exposed to. Uh, you know, the great thing I believe about investment banking is that, you know, one, it will challenge you unlike any career. I think that's a great thing. Personally, professionally, to be challenged uh, is a wonderful thing. Two, I believe you're just going to be exposed to thought leaders across, you know, many different industries, you know, within banking, out of banking. You're going to be current on what's going on in the world. Um, and you're going to understand business, you know, really unlike any of your peers. Um, and so every day when you walk into work, um, you know that no day will be like the day before. Uh, there are um, uh, you know, new things to be learned new things to work on, you'll be interacting with new people, 
even I've been doing this with Tom Lee now, I guess for about 25 years, I can honestly tell you that I am learning new things every day, even at this stage in my career, which I just think is great. I look back on my career, and I think you know, every three or four years, I was exposed to really something different. I started out doing M&A, worked in New York, moved out to LA, worked you know, out there, back to New York. So I've seen you know, different parts of the country. I moved into financial institutions, so I was exposed to an entire new sector, then into debt capital markets. I was a part of the telecom crash back in 2000, I probably contributed to it. Um, but all of these things really, you know, ups and downs has really sort of, you know, led itself to me to have just, I think it's been a very, very rich career. And I, you know, and for all of you who are thinking about, um, you know, an analyst position at any of these firms, <coughs> or, or any, you know, even some of the smaller boutiques that are on some of these handouts, I think you'll find it to be just an absolutely worthwhile experience. But it really, something that you're going to really need to get to yourself. So Bob, uh, can you talk to the students uh, to give them some insight into the competitiveness of the job market as you see it right now? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, A6 grad, and back then, the Wall Street Journal used to quote a statistic about how many people worked on Wall Street. And I talked about this a little bit, but there's a lot of us that we had to work on a little bit of city in town. And the, the number was 750,000, that's what we call it. So, that was in 86. Right now, I mean, that's your guess. So the New York City Comptroller's <coughs> study recently. It's 169,000 people that work in financial services in New York City. So the, you, you need to understand that the industry, uh, from an employment standpoint, working on Wall Street, we're in structural decline. That's very important. So uh, the good news is, is that there's 169,000 jobs available on Wall Street, all the participants. So, um, you know, you need to be very aware that it's a tremendously competitive environment for, for positions. Uh, you need to be very aware that uh, uh, the competition, in many cases, has had perfect SAT scores, have had uh, at least one international experience, have had a range of prior internships um, uh, before their senior year, so it's just a tremendously competitive environment. From all different schools, and Wall Street's feeding from many, many different schools these days. So, uh, you mentioned to me uh, earlier today that back in 1986, when you were 21 years old, probably, <coughs> you, you, you were lucky enough to get super in with Chase, Chase Manhattan Bank, and you kind of have an interviewing technique that was very good. Yes, this was, um, I didn't realize it was valuable until I experienced it. So you do want to think on your feet a little bit when you're, when you're sitting down at Super Day. So I had about 10 different interviews. And um, I was very well prepared. I went to New York to meet the Chase Manhattan Bank, which is now combined. And um, when it's my turn to ask questions, I asked a couple questions to the first person. And then, uh, you know, received a response, talked a little bit about it. And then the next person, um, when it's my turn to ask questions, I couldn't think of what questions three and four were there if you wanted to. So I had to ask one of the same questions. And lo and behold, you know what? I was I was kind of educated because I already knew what I thought the answer was. I knew what the first person said. And I stuck with that theme throughout the day. So by the end of the day, I was very engaged and engaging on a couple topics that were both tactical and strategic uh, to some of these managers that I met at Chase. So, so, um, you know, if there's, the, the advice would be to really, um, um, you know, leverage what you learn throughout the day if you do get into that position, feed upon it. You know, I changed my approach with, with the question as I learned, but it was just an interesting little piece of uh, a little technique that I learned along the way. And, uh, you know, the, the manager, so if George is sitting around eating pizza at the end of the day, not really marking to market what questions you asked, it's really a, you know, maybe a personality discussion a lot more than, hey, you know, this person asked this and this person asked that. So um, don't be afraid that there might be some comparison of notes. Thank you. So um, how many people in here are in school that ask? That's good. That's really good. Because our two panelists are from AS. The, the, 
Kathleen's and the Catherine's. So, so, what I'd like to ask each of you to talk a little bit about exactly, um, I guess, did you ever mention this presentation before? So, one yes, one no. So, it's kind of like if you were a freshman and a sophomore, and what would you do differently? And you talk a little bit about what you do differently so they can kind of act that way. And then the follow-up question would be, you talk a little bit about exactly how you got your job this, this past summer. So, New Jersey goes first. New Jersey goes first. Did you guys all hear that? Okay. 
for the export essentially if we probably hire 75 people, we probably back to 6 billion revenue. But I, I, I might be wrong. I might be wrong. Maybe something structural has changed. Now, that's above my paper. So that answers your question. But I would tell you, you know, private wealth, you know, asset management, you know, those are areas of the business that have a lot more growth opportunity than investment banking specifically. And that center there has, from a regulatory point of view, has an enormous amount of growth. So. Oh, okay. Jeff, I'll sure. Um, one of the concerns that a lot of people have with, say, the private owner is that you have the opportunity to set the business, but it's going to be safe to do it. You can do it also. It's a lot tougher to do it. It's a lot tougher to do it. It's a lot tougher to do it. And 
um, Kirby might have a few hundred. They weren't sure what to do. So they brought in a bunch of MBAs, trained them, uh, learned all types of products, uh, all types of sales skills. I did it for two years. It was great. And then when I picked up on a little product called Morgan and uh, uh, moved to the institutional side of the market and became a very good group. Five years later, I was managing a credit group. And did that for five years. We made salespeople selling credit products. We created credit directors, interest rate swaps. So it's it's a great uh, place to build a career and a great place to learn about all types of financial products. And the, the opportunity to see um, deals that are put together in the primary market and understand them and understand the economics and understand the buying behavior of the clients. It's, it's a fabulous fabulous opportunity to learn about products. And I just give you another just fact. On the, on the trading floor at Credit Suisse, I mean, I grew apart. I'm the single oldest person on the floor. I'm 57. The, the, the number of people who are in private wealth who are my age, they can work till they're 70. They all can, and they can adjust their capital <coughs> schedules, et cetera. Bill Dell is here, who's my partner in this all this time. He's a year older than me. You know, but he, he spends, he goes to Florida like every weekend in the winter. And he works out of the Merrill office in Long Beach or wherever that is and stuff. So, you know, you think about the entrepreneurial part, think about when you, you, know, you don't own your business, but you own your business, and your ability to extend your career quite a bit. So, those are good questions. Thank you. Over here. Uh, right back. To the first of all, I want to thank you guys for coming out today. Second of all, uh, my question relates to the discuss the core competencies. Can you speak a little bit to the specialties related to each of your areas that you look for in an engineer, such as um, learning modeling before going into banking, or maybe learning some wealth management skills before going into private all areas? Ryan, you want to take the first one? Sure. We, uh, you know, I think uh, in order to be competitive for a position within investment banking, you know, having that quality, you know, quantitative skill set is very, very important. Um, so, you know, a lot of finance, a lot of accounting, um, there are different classes and programs uh, you know, that you can take to teach you um, a lot about modeling that would be you know, readily applicable to do the job. So, you know, it is very, very important to, you know, to have that skill set just to, you know, to be able to compete for a position and once you have a position, um, to be competitive within whatever firm or whatever group you're in. Now, is it a prerequisite? You know, no. Um, most uh, organizations, you know, our own organization has a, a training program, and you know, we will bring uh, people in um, for uh, for several months to you know teach them accounting, modeling, you know, the way we do business. Um, but clearly, lacking that, you know, you're a step behind everyone else. Uh, so, uh, in terms of, you know, just remarked earlier about being prepared, these are things that you can do now if you're really interested, really have a passion for, you know, for banking. These are things you can do now to start preparing for, you know, your eventual uh, career choice. Yeah, I would just add to that that, uh, you know, Princeton, Yale, and Harvard are all the core schools of credit schools for investment banking. You cannot get an accounting degree there. You cannot. It's, it, it, it's not offered. And so well, we hire them from there as investment banking. So I think you have to demonstrate that you're smart. I think you have to demonstrate that you can figure it out. I think Brian's spot on. But it's a lot easier if you kind of done the work in advance. Uh, and then, so your question on like, well, you know, Steve, you talked a little bit about, like, when you think about like, what are the one or two core skills that you're looking for when you're interviewing what we're looking for is somebody who wants it. They want the job, they're go get it, they're not afraid to take no for an answer, and they're willing to, to run through the walls to get things done. That's really, really what we're looking for. If you want to be coming to class. On the analyst role, on some of those roles on the team, it's more of you know, you have to be more analytical mind that the you know more macro thinker, a long term financial planner type like person. Okay. So I'm sure I have a question. Mr. Paul, you were talking earlier about the 
Rick Meyer. Uh, you were talking earlier about how 10 years ago you didn't think that the uh, Illinois students were adequately prepared for these interviews. Uh, how have you seen the Illinois students grow, and uh, what specifically did they do to improve? The, the, the proof's in the pudding, meaning that more and more students are getting jobs. And um, I happened to go away this summer, but we had a, a panel discussion for all the juniors that were in Manhattan this year. And you know, Bobby was there. How many people were there? Right? How many people were there? It's not right there. Like, how many? Like, 300, 200? Yeah, we actually have a we had a lot of wage money. Yeah. So we looked at it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I think our results speak for themselves. Um, having said that, I, I still hear you know, similar stories of, let's just call it lack of preparation and uh, you know, not being focused on exactly understanding the firm, understanding what the role is. But those were really, really important things walk in there and you'll hear a lot of people your dad probably says to you, hey, just go interview it. You know, leave well, there's a proctor game, we'll go practice, go practice on Xerox and stuff. You know, but don't go practice at Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley or Barclays if that's the job you really, really want. If you really want in this industry, go practice, good advice. But you know, if you go through these slides and you think about things that we've talked about today and you're prepared, and you're prepared in terms of knowing your resume, in terms of understanding these core competencies and where you fit in, you know, like so, you have leadership. If I ask you a leadership skill question, you should say, "I'm a leader because," um, you know the answer. You know, I think that I'm a team player because. You know, everything is here's the fact, and then here's the, here's the information that backs up that statement. So it's the statement back, the fact backs it up, and so. You know, the, the, the Bill Noble students is good as ever like, I guess I'm a hard marker. So you got, I would still continue to like to see more. Having said that, you know, we're, we're getting lots of people jobs. And you guys are really lucky, Bill Noble's are very into helping Bill Noble's. It means not here anymore, but in that Business Week, uh, Business Week Bloomberg survey, Bill alumni helping students is one of our highest scores, correct? And Fenders is not in head, so it is correct. So if you have that advantage, just, just do your homework. And, and pay attention to markets. Pay attention, pay attention to what's going on. I mean, believe me, if you ask me to talk about Dodd Frank, you know, I'm, I'm not an expert in the you know, But if you're going to go talk to him about job and operations, you don't have to be an expert on Dodd Frank. But you better have some point of view. Um, you know, Catherine and Catherine, you know, one of you working in any compliance area, they, 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 they have to understand that. You, have to have, you don't have to understand it to its core. But you have to have spent 45 minutes to an hour thinking about it. Now, in, in today's world, with the internet and such, it's so easy to get information. And you, know, you just have to take it out. Just do the work. Just do the work. So I think, so I've been interviewing back on campus um, for the last 10 or 11 years. And I've seen the improvement. The place where I think we've kind of plateaued, the improvement has been clearly in academic caliber of students. I wouldn't get into the law today, um, and I do have a degree for it, but I wouldn't get in um, if I was applying again with 18 years old. Okay, so you guys, have, you've already passed a much higher bar than I had to to get here, but when in the preparation for the interview, you're intellectually and academically better prepared than you were, the places where I still see gaps is the preparation for a specific role and a specific company you're going to interview with. Um, maybe my experience is that with people who actually don't want to work with me, so they might practice it. Um, but I also do think that a number of people have hired, and then we've gotten through it, um, have been you know, unprepared to understand what is operations. And it doesn't, there isn't a textbook, right? There's no place you can look this up. <coughs> but there's an awful lot of people at the school who have worked in operations, right? And had internships over the last two or three years, and you still know them. They're fraternity brothers and, and sorority sisters, they're friends in clubs, they're kids you went to high school with, they're people you still keep in touch with, you see them all coming. Ask them questions about what their job was like. Okay, find out an alumni like me who list all of our contact details in the alumni network so that you can come ask us questions about what the jobs are like. What are people going to ask you when they interview for a job in operations, or compliance, or finance, or sales and trade? Right? What, what are they going to ask about? What are things going to be important? Right? The, the, the candidates who come in and ask me sort of esoteric, um, structured equity 
questions and the things that really sparked because it took some advanced class in you know, equity trading strategies. I have no idea. I don't care. That's why I'm not afraid. Okay. But if the person comes in and says, I read this story about something that's happening or some part of the market that's getting distorted because of the regulatory changes, and what does the word extraterritoriality mean? Okay. I, you know, when I say, do you have any questions? Yeah, what does that mean to you? What, how does it change your job? Okay. That's an intelligent question that says, okay, I know, I've listened to what you said all day you know, in the last 20 minutes, and I understand where you work, or I went to the pre night last night, and I know what your job is, okay. and so I did my homework, and I'm going to ask you a question because I read this and I don't understand. Right? Doing the follow-up email, when you see something you know, in the paper, and especially if you've got a job, right, you want to build your network and you keep talking to people, you see something in the paper you don't understand, you thought it was interesting, flip an email and ask me what it means. Right? I don't know how to answer, but it tells me you're interested, it tells me you're engaged. But that's how you build a valuable network and relationship with people. Um, I mean, walking in knowing that Jane Corbin is the CEO of Morgan Stanley, you better. But knowing what operations does, right, and what my role is in Morgan Stanley, is much more valuable. Talking to somebody who worked for me last summer, right, and looking at some people in this room who worked for me last summer, right, that's going to help you a lot more uh, when you get to the interview. The answer is on this slide. So slide 12, you know, take this slide and think about it. But you know, this, I gave you, I mean, I probably gave you as many slides as I could with my big schools, which is less and more. But the answer is to try to really help you guys get through pieces of that piece if you were just being given it. Um, how are we doing on that time, Brendan? I'll leave about 15 minutes if there's more yeah, Okay, fine. Um, more questions?
It's a launching pad for a lot of different things, a lot of different opportunities. And the skill set that you acquire in two or three years are readily applicable to almost anything imaginable that you can do for a career. Uh, you know, for me personally, you know, the reason I'm still in it, I really think is just because it is, you know, you know, over the course of my career, you know, I was exposed to many, many different things. Um, you know, I began my career at Chase as well. You know, began an M&A, and you know, and every two or three years, they moved you. You know, to different groups, different areas. They moved, moved me geographically, um, and so, uh, and so, everything you know was new. You never got stale in position. And again, as I said earlier, even today, you know, I'm still learning. Um, you know, things in business, no matter what you know, sectors you're covering. Ability, healthcare, technology, things are moving at such a rapid pace that you're constantly learning. So, you know, you know, so you know, I've enjoyed it. I've had just a, a tremendous career, but I just, you know, when I look back on it, you know, it's never really, you know, sort of been the same, you know, sort of job over those, you know, those 25 years. It's really changed dramatically. Um, and even, you know, business itself is, you know, as Overnight, it's just you know, very, very different than it was five years ago, ten years ago, fifteen years ago. So, uh, so it's just a very exciting career choice as far as I'm concerned. Sure, thank you. Thanks. Sure. Um, I'll do this five. Yeah, the traits. Which one for for all of you uh, is the most important that a interviewer or someone you're interviewing you don't think can go without? You have to pick one. And why? Uh, I'll answer, and everyone else can put their own two cents in. But um, you know, in baseball, you can't hit the ball so you don't get it in the batter's box. You're not going to get the batter's box if you're not going to see it. It doesn't mean that's not, let's be clear. You can be very successful in this business without having to be a great student. Great experience. 
we did have to do that very quickly. Um, and so I think getting that nailed down as quickly as we can when we're younger um, is good that way you just keep pumping it because the employers just aren't going to be able to look at it if it's not in top condition. It's going to the right way, conveying your skills and um, who you are in the right way. So definitely not the best for